Most of you know that every Saturday we do a comic book retrospective where we review an old comic book. What you don't know is we record these about two and a half, three weeks ahead of time. And then I post produce them as we get closer to that weekend. Obviously, we didn't know at the time reviewing the new Teen Titans number two that George Perez was no longer going to be with us. We obviously got the word today that he, he passed on yesterday. So I did want to take a moment before we get into the retrospective, get into the review to, to acknowledge what a tremendous talent, what a tremendous person George Perez was. The legend that he is and the impact that he's leaving on the comic book industry is absolutely tremendous. This is a wonderful comic book. I hope you enjoy it. And God bless you to George Perez and his family. You will be missed. And your legacy will certainly live on forever. It's time to get the comic book retro crew back together. This time we're going to DC Comics. A very important issue, the new Teen Titans number two, the first appearance of a lot of different characters. And here with me to talk about that is the normal crew. We've got award-winning comic book editor, writer Joe Corrala. How are you doing, Joe? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing brilliant. We've also got the man so cool they called the Breed, the comic book hoarder himself, the voice of the voiceless, Eric Breed. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You're going to be doing much better once we get into this bad boy. So we've got the new Teen Titans number two. Today, the Terminator, December of 1980. I don't know, the illustrious pairing of Marv Wolfman and George Press, one of the greatest creative pairs in the history of comic books. And we get so many first appearances here. We get the first appearance of Deathstroke, the Terminator, the first appearance of Wintergreen, Ravager, and Trigon, kind of, sort of. So this character, Deathstroke, ends up being pretty phenomenal as a villain. He's kind of watered down today, Joe. They kind of just throw him in there to get beat up by everybody, kind of like Thanos within Marvel Comics. But there yeah. for a while, Deathstroke was kind of unbeatable. You might not have lost as in you didn't die, but you didn't really beat him. Yeah, no, he was a very formidable foe. Uh, obviously, leading up through the Judas contract is... Uh, you know, really beloved run on this book, and he'd go on and be used multiple times since, had multiple uh, series of his own, and only a month prior to this issue coming out, DC also created uh, Mongol with uh, Len Wein and Jim Starlin, so you had you have two heavy-hitting villains that are still threats to this day, came out a month apart from each other in 1980. Jim Starlin created Mongol and Thanos. That's pretty impressive. Right. He might have been able to write some comic books. Yeah. He had a few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that Let's... kid might have gone places. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's not dilly-dally <laughs> too much. Let's get right into this comic book because there's, for just a single issue, there is so much going on, on here just as far as uh, personal dynamics between the team, as far as action and whatnot. So we kind of open up. There's an argument going on between Grant Wilson and his girlfriend, and he's kind of getting physical with her here, Breen. He's not being very nice. Next thing we know, we see Corey. We, we see Wonder Girl show up, Donna Troy. They do not like him putting his hands on her. He ends up getting kind of blasted away, and they kind of kick him out of his own apartment, kind of setting up the, the stage of what's going to happen with this new character, Ravager. Yeah, they'd set this up in the first issue. They introduced you know, Grant and... The, the girl, I think Becky, I think might have been, was her name. And so this, you know, it, it escalates into issue two and sets up, you know, his reason for, you know, wanting revenge because he wants, you know, his, his relationships busted up. And now these you know, superpower beings are getting involved. So he's going to do something about it. Absolutely. He does not appear to be a very nice man, Joe. And what we see after this is very interesting. We see the very first appearance of Deathstroke the Terminator. That is how they introduce him, essentially interviewed by Hive, who want to hire someone to go kill the new Teen Titans. Apparently they can tell that they are going to be a threat and they want to hire the best of the best. They tell him they will not pay him up front. They, they give cash after the job is done. He tells him to go get bent. And then he gets kind of attacked, and it turns out he's kind of in an X-Men style training hologram area, and it wasn't all real. But the Hive were absolutely monitoring him, and they're kind of setting him up to work for them for free, essentially, moving forward. They are able to sort of trick him slightly. You know, he doesn't quite realize that he's uh, not dealing with real people, but they're like holograms or whatever in that room as the hives monitoring him and you know they're very much like okay great we analyzed him 
and now we're going to have our own death stroke set things up so we don't need him and and it keeps developing over the course of the issue this is at this point like marv wolfman and george perez are are telling very dense stories this whole issue you know it's not a super long issue it's like 25 pages but it's like a six-part story in one issue there's a ton going on here and uh, you know it goes back it, it all fits together real nicely at this point there's i guess we find out that gar's family is is richer than bruce way like when when dick grayson sees where they live he's like you know i thought bruce wayne's mansion was a lot but this is a lot you know and he you know so kind of uh explaining gar comes from a very uh, privileged existence at least as far as monetarily speaking definitely hitting hard that gar is a horn dog he is hornier than any character i've ever seen in comic books and also really setting up the character dynamics and the relationships and they're also really good at, at uh, hitting home that Corey is not from this place she does not know really how to act like a hero and she's not really good on like holding back her, as far as her powers this this is also the uh first time in comics that uh starfire learns english yes she makes out with dick Grayson. apparently that's all she needs to learn a new language yeah and like you were saying uh you, you know uh, gar quickly follows that up with you know well i know german and uh, <laughs> got more you know, languages. other languages if you <laughs> if you're interested <laughs> and george Perez really goes out of his way to make sure that uh, donna troy and uh and starfire are looking very nice in their their poolside wear and it, it certainly is also inferred that Gar kind of set him up with the smallest bikinis that he could find because he is the world's horniest man. We also get the idea that Wally West tried to give up on being a superhero. He just wanted to be a student, but he got dragged back into it, and he kind of shows up. And we're getting really the, the beginning dynamics of this Teen Titans team that will really kind of uh, stand the test of time. But what we also see Eric Breen is that in the beginning there's this little confrontation and there's this like pink robot thing and they need to analyze it and they ask cyborg to take it back to his dad at star labs he does not want to he's had enough of his dad he blames him essentially for what happened to his mom he blames him for what happened to him and he doesn't really want to talk to him but he does bring the robot there we don't get a lot of information but we do see that there is a lot of tension between cyborg and his father yeah, that that was set up from the beginning, and it's you know, fleshed out more in the cyborg one shot tales of the Teen Titans that gave each of the new issues or new members one issue to basically do expanded origins. Yeah, he, he and his father's major friction between the two, and of course, it's a classic case of the son doesn't have all the facts. He doesn't know that what happened is actually killing his dad, who's too stubborn and prideful to tell his son that. So you have these two strong-willed characters butting heads. Vic really didn't want to go to his dad for anything, even to help the team, but he does it grudgingly. And you see, and that's, you know, as I'm sure you're about to get to, where things escalate. Absolutely, because this is su such good work on the part of Marv Wolfman and George Perez, who would have been co-writing at this point, plotting it out and whatnot, because they're doing so much groundwork for these characters moving forward in the relationships. We haven't even gotten into Raven and the stuff with Deathstroke yet, but also, I mean, that's a, a, a comic book's worth of uh, character progression already stuffed into like the first six or seven pages. So they're really utilizing the real estate in the comic very well. We'll talk about Raven before we get into to the Deathstroke stuff. So we see Raven, and I believe this is the, the first appearance of Trigod, as she's gone to this place and no humans can be there. And she has put the Teen Titans together for a reason, but they don't know why. Wally West thinks he might be being used by Raven, that she might be manipulating his mind or something like that to join the team. But this is really interesting stuff that Raven is kind of the uh, the connective tissue that brings all these characters together. No, and uh, you know, Raven being created by Marvel and George Perez, the Raven, uh, you know, um, Starfire and Cyborg were, were new creations uh, for this team. And then, you, you know, Wally, you know, Dick, Donna, they all existed prior to this, as well as, you know, uh, Gar, who was Beast Boy in Doom Patrol, which had been canceled. And later on, we see how much Marv and, and George, uh, you know, admired Arnold Drake, uh, Bruno, and, you know, the Silver Age Doom Patrol, because we, we see those characters come back in the, these pages. 
So, so it's an interesting way to go about it. But yeah, they figured out they created this character of Raven and you know Trigon, all that to be the the catalyst to bring everyone together in, in a way that felt more meaningful. Because the previous iterations of the Titans, you know, they worked until they didn't. Uh, you, you know, the Silver Age run, and then in the Bronze Age again, it it, it kind of missed the mark long term. But but this really set up such a a solid, not just. Uh, reason to bring them together but it had this air of like mystery so you were also reading it to to sort of uncover this mystery but they didn't beat you over the head of, with it about it being like oh you're reading this just for the mystery it was just another layer in all the layers they were building that made this book so compelling yeah so that was absolutely well done well, let's get to this terminator stuff and along the way breen we do see that the terminator even though he hasn't been hired is still monitoring the teen titans he knows what's up with the team, and he can see that they're, even though that they're new, they're formidable. But Hive have another plan. They want to make their own Terminator. They want to get their own Deathstroke, as Joe was kind of alluding to earlier, where they had scanning or whatever. They go and they get Grant Wilson, who we met in the very beginning of the issue, who wasn't a very nice guy. He was kind of getting physical with his girlfriend. And they decide that Deathstroke can only use 90% of his human mind capacity. They're going to up it up to 100%, and he's going to be even more deadlier and uh, even more formidable than Deathstroke the Terminator, and they basically send him through the tre treatment. He comes out Ravager, this new form of, uh, you know, kind of a spinoff of Deathstroke himself, but supposedly he's going to be more powerful. Deathstroke kind of intercedes with him, and he does give him the information that, hey, whenever you use your powers, it's going to suck the life force out of you the way, with what's happened to you, so you can't use them or you're going to die, and it really sets up a lot of the stuff that's going to really pay off in this issue. Yeah, because you know, he attacks you know, Victor at his father's lab, basically gets driven back, and when he comes back to try again, you know, he attacks the, the whole team. They even say, you know, you know, Robin says, cut this out. He goes, you know, it's seven on one. You know, Deathstroke shows up seven on two, and it's on, but Deathstroke, I think, is more there to do the job because he knows what's going to happen to the Ravager. Because when they have a conversation earlier, Grant keeps telling Terminator, said, you know, my father said how great you were, but you're just jealous of me, it turns out. So Grant's mind is gone. Yeah, it was probably gone before he even underwent the treatment. So he's, like I said, he, yeah, he's definitely on borrowed time. Yeah, the battle is, it's not even really that much of a battle. Because he's, like I said, you know, every time he uses any powers, it's 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 killing him. We also see some conflict going on between Starfire and the rest of the team as they're telling her to use, stop using her star bolts. You know, you never know what's going to go up, what's going to happen. Ravager looks like he's about to die. We don't kill people. We need to stop. Raven shows up and she's like, "You guys can go on your peace and stuff." So we do see a little bit of friction within the team here, Joe. But they did attack him at poolside. They were very formidable. But as Slade Wilson had told Grant Wilson, and I, obviously at this point we didn't know his name was Slade Wilson. We just knew him as Deathstroke the Terminator because he'd just been introduced. Using that power essentially kills him at that moment. That kind of sets up a, a long-term villain because Deathstroke the Terminator blames the Teen Titans for this, the death of Ravager. Even though they didn't really do anything to him, the Star Bolts, they, they mentioned specifically, they did not hit him. But him using his power trying to kill him is actually what did him in. And Raven's like, you should be blaming Hive because they're the ones that created it. They, they do this sweet little bit, you know, Raven there at the end where when uh, Grant's asking, like, if they got him, you know, she creates this illusion. So it looks mm -hmm. like they they died so he can die in peace. But, yeah, they set it up and it's all like, well, you know, that's just not how it works. I, I think the, the line is, yeah, that's not the way it works in my racket, sister. The kid took a contract and he died because of you. And that's that's how it goes on about it. So we've set all of this up. There are so many moving parts here. <laughs> There's friction within the team building up over this. They're not sure if they can trust Raven. They're not sure if they can trust Starfire. They're not sure um, how they're going to be able to move forward. They're not sure if Cyborg's going to be as helpful as he can be because of the conflict he has with his father. Now Hive seems like they put their pieces out there and are like, okay, now we've kind of manipulated Deathstroke, the Terminator, into doing what we want. So all these things are going on. We get the reveal that, you know, Grant Wilson is, you know, Deathstroke's son at the end here. 
And on top of all of that, they lead in for the next issue with, and the creation of the most villainous supergroup of all, the Fearsome Five, is, is mm-hmm. going to be for issue three. And they, you know, with the Hive stuff, <laughs> we also get confirmation that because his son failed to to fulfill the contract, Deathstroke has taken the contract onto himself. So he is, it's his mission moving forward to kill the Teen Titans to, to yep. finish the contract. So they are in a world of hurt. This is just a fantastic uh, issue. You just don't see this much stuff put into a well-constructed comic book like this. And there's so many different levels of uh, of conflict going on here, Breed. It's just absolutely brilliant. You would never see anything like this on a market today. No, as Joe likes to say, this would be an omnibus if it were half a today. year. At yeah. least. But uh, there are a couple Easily. things in this issue it, that when um, Grant's girlfriend in, is arguing with him, she said that you're going to turn out to be just like your father and your brother. And I'm guessing originally the character that ended up becoming Jericho they had a different idea in mind because when we finally do meet him, he's very different from his father and his brother. But and the yeah, best I said superhero that, outfit ever. Yeah, the, the scene with um <laughs> when Jack of Hearts would like a word. Um the 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 scene with Raven at the end, that's you know, she's an empath, and that's you know, just so true to her character that she would do that. And it kind of shows the difference between you know, heroes. You realize that she may have, a, you know, very, very much a dark side, but at her core, she is a good person, and that's kind of a way to show that this issue is a masterpiece. Another good oh, call, yeah, this Joseph. Five star comic here. Uh, if people do want to get this, obviously, there's probably a reprint out there. Where can they get them in collections, Joe? They're omnibus. Oh, they're- they got to get the trades. There are trades. There's an omnibus. They're reprinting the uh, volume one omnibus, uh, so that should be coming in the in the coming months. The trade paperbacks, uh, very easy to get through. You know, Comicsology or digital. Uh, I think the DC Universe. At, you know, where, wherever you can get it digitally, it, it's easily available. Um, you know, th- this is a run they really try to keep in print uh, for very obvious reasons. Joe, you did select a couple for next week. Did we decide on what we're going to do next week if the viewers want to be ready for the next retrospective? Yeah, uh, we're going to do uh, Web of Spider-Man number one. It's a key Spider-Man issue. Uh, got a great work there from uh, Wheezy, uh, Greg LaRock. So this should be a good time. George Perez and Marv Wolfman on Teen Titans is such an amazing run. We've actually already done a retrospective with this team, with these characters, Starfire versus Blackfire. If you've never seen this story arc, definitely check out this retrospective. This is a great video, a great story arc. And if you can't get enough of the comic book retrospective, we have an entire playlist of over 50 videos with comic book retros of classic comic books. Definitely check that out as well.